Good evening, um, everybody. Yeah, can all you hear me? Yeah, can? Yes. Uh, welcome to our sixth webinar of uh, Asia Pacific Society for Computer Education, our sixth uh, webinar in our webinar series, which actually we started, we launched it in uh, last year. Um, but today, tonight's topic is uh, we call it Nurturing Socially Responsible Behavior with the Solved Project, the COVID 19 response. So, this is something that we're I think mean, while well, uh, have been have been uh, reading some of the papers uh, which recently published, right, uh, talking about more about the studies on uh, how COVID nineteen affected uh, whatever uh, this uh, education uh, this uh, uh, landscape uh, in different parts of the world, how home based learning happening or how home based learning didn't work, or or but uh, we do have some some people actually started already start. Uh, uh, by developing something really, really new and really, really exciting uh, for us to actually tackle these issues about how to educate our students uh, uh, in dealing with this pandemic. Uh, so uh, this is really my pleasure to invite uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Kenneth Lim from uh, National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, uh, to talk about uh, what they have, uh, they have developed, this team have developed, and also actually already already roll out uh, in Singapore, and uh, he's also working on publishing some papers. So he is my colleague, a research scientist in the Center of Research in Pedagogy and Practice in NIE National Institute of Education in Singapore. Uh, he recently held an editorship of a special issue in the British Journal of Educational Technology. Uh, the topic is on learning with our augmented augmented reality. Um, his interests are more in design of learning environments from phenomenological perspectives, particularly those which affords the surfacing of learner intuition. Uh, so uh, now let's, uh, uh, I just uh, put the stage to him, uh, let him start his uh, talk. Yeah, please. Uh. Thank you, Long Xiang, for the very kind introduction. And so, I would also like uh, to stop sharing as well. <laughs> stop sharing. Stop. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, members of the society for uh, kindly extending the invitation to me and my colleagues to uh, share share our work with you uh, today. And um, if I if uh if yeah so um it's been it's been quite a busy week for our team and uh if i look a bit tired i i beg your indulgence and excuse 
Um, okay, so um, let's start with our introductory slide. Uh, I'm joined today, this evening, uh, by my colleague Ahmed. So um, the our hosts in the society have kindly given us uh, um, 40 minutes or so to share our work with you. And Ahmed and I will be talking uh, uh, more or less um, 20 minutes of, of uh, followed by another 20 minutes. Uh, so in the first 20 minutes, I'll be giving you an overview of what the project is about, what our intervention is about. And in the second 20 minutes, uh, Ahmed will take you through a demonstration uh, so that you can get a better idea. And then we'll, I, I guess we'll follow up with questions uh, after that. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, now, uh, I'm a little bit under the weather because I've been work, uh, it's just been a very long day. Okay, pardon me. Now, um, so let's start with the, the slide and I'll now try to share my screen. Uh, Sam, let me know if uh, the screen sharing uh, uh, doesn't go as planned. So uh, let's see. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe we should be okay, right? With this, Long Yeah, you let me know if. Yeah, you let me know if uh, things are not going as planned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So. Um, uh, so. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so it's not presentation mode yet. Oh, it's not presentation mode. Okay. Yeah. It's not presentation mode. Huh? Okay. So we need to switch this thing. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Okay. So, um, yeah, my mind is not really uh, firing on all cylinders right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, now, so, uh, what what my what Amit and I uh, would like to share with you today is basically a project uh, which we've been working on with teachers uh, over the past um, eight months or so since about March and April. Uh, when we were first approached by a team of uh, uh, mathematics teachers. Um, I think um, I'm very grateful to Long Xiang for, for the kind introduction because um, I, I think he's um, identified what we've, we, we believe is unique about our project in the sense that although uh, this year has uh, catalyzed and precipitated a number of uh, education innovations um, and uh, um, perturbations, um, they are primarily to do with uh, overcoming constraints uh, um, of COVID and uh, in terms of uh, um, the, ho the whole um, disruption of uh, home-based le learning. What we've tried to do with uh, the teachers that we work with is that we've tried instead to approach the problem from a conceptually uh, um, opposite way, in the sense that we've tried to uh, we've tried to look at how our young learners in schools uh, how how they they are trying to make sense of the the new normal, so to speak, and um, how they are trying to make sense of the the new exhortations to to practice uh, social distancing, to wear masks, and how we as teachers can possibly uh, might possibly use these uh, um, might possibly use these uh, 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 new habits as resources in and of themselves. So, in other words, how how does a child approach the new habit or the need to practice the discipline of wearing a mask? How does a child approach the need to practice the new discipline of social distancing? And how can those approaches be leveraged, be tapped upon by us as educators, as resources for learning, as resources for connection to formal curriculum? Um, because really, if you think about it, on the one hand, there's the social values. And on the other hand, there's the formal curriculum. And very often, children find it difficult to bridge between the two. So what we're trying to do is to help form the bridges. Okay, so I guess things will become a little bit more clear later on as I continue talking. So let's go to the first slide. 
Um, um, this was taken from a, 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 a this was taken from a lift uh, from an elevator in um, in a in a Thai hospital, and um, I, I think we are all kind of I mean maybe some of us have been experienced the 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 uh, the, exp the unfortunate experience of being stuck in a lift uh, a lift which isn't working, um, and under normal circumstances it can be very claustrophobic and uncertain. Um, but in in circumstances of pandemic, in circumstances of COVID, uh, if if we are in the unfortunate circumstance of being stuck in a lift, um, then all the more it might be we, we might feel very. Um, I mean, it can be quite threatening. Um, now, with home based learning, with everybody uh, or with the uh, many of our students um, in the safe confines of their home. Um, how how do we as teachers, how do we as educators, get the students to 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 feel the effective uh, connection, uh, to feel the empathy between getting stuck in a lift uh, when they are actually their physical selves are in the comfort and safety of their home, um, I, uh, not not in a claustrophobic situation, so. Um, so this 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 goes to a question of empathy and of uh, effect, and one of the ways that uh, we've tried to uh, design around this is through our work uh, in embodied cognition, and uh, this will be one strand which we'll talk about quite soon. Okay, so um, the acronym SOBE stands for socially responsible behavior through embodied thinking, and um, so I've already. Uh, in my in my introductory comments, I've already precursed with embodied cognition and social responsibility, and that's how we are trying to uh, tie the two together. So basically, the project is a learning activity in response to changing settings of learning. Okay, yeah, as I said, um, of course, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, uh, especially as the months have worn on, of um, young people of uh, mature adults. Uh, not necessarily uh, walking the talk or not necessarily uh, behaving in ways which uh, might be construed as uh, socially responsible. And even in Singapore, uh, there has been, a, to an extent, there, there are signs of um, um, fatigue setting in uh, and people letting their guard down. So, um, for example, uh, our Minister for Health has said that as more activities resume, it has become more critical for each of us to play a part to exercise social responsibility in order to keep our family and friends safe. So if, if this is the exhortation from the, the state, how is it translated down to schools and how is it translated down to informal learning environments, which are sometimes uh, beyond the immediate control of the teacher? So as, as we look around the world, we can see that different countries have, of course, had different responses in terms of the severity of lockdown or circuit breaker. And this has, uh, these differential responses have in turn resulted in um, whether it's the second wave or the so-called third wave, which is to come. Yeah. Um, and it's generally agreed, of course, that three simple acts, uh, mask wearing, washing hands, and uh, practicing social distancing. Um, now, uh, so different, different states around the world, different uh, government entities uh, have different ways of, uh, of uh, encouraging these uh, uh, new habits to, to form. And, uh, but generally, however, uh, we see that there's a disconnect between the discipline of uh, practicing these new habits with respect to the any positive or negative feedback which we get um, on these habits. So we go about our daily businesses every day and it's only after a time lag of about 24 hours when we actually get any feedback on whether our decision makings, our personal decisions on, um, on the kinds of uh, behaviors that we practice uh, as we interact with the general public, um, the, the, the feedback on whether these have made any difference or not. Yeah, so there's a disconnect uh, and because there's a disconnect, it becomes very difficult to actually uh, have a authentic understanding of, of 
of why we want to do what we are told to do. Yeah. So in different cultures, again, we have different ways of trying to uh, encourage uh, people. Uh, so this is taken from Germany, for example. This is taken from Canada. And these are taken from uh, Weibo in China. Okay, so um, um, here in Singapore, uh, schools have signs like these, uh, which help, uh, which try to encourage children to, 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 to be sensible. However, what we are trying to do is we are trying to get the children to do these habits because they believe in them and because they personally have experienced uh, an activity which helps them to understand the severity and the need to practice these habits rather than simply because the teacher or the government tells them to do so. That is the objective of the survey project. How do we go about doing this? We go about doing this by um, by first giving, uh, by designing a, a, a two-fold activity. Um, but the first half of the activity is an embodied uh, interaction half, followed by a post-activity dialogic debrief uh, based on data from the embodied half. And in, uh, the hope is that in the, over the medium to long term, um, the dialogic discussion of the data from the embodied interaction uh, leads to uh, leads to um, spills over into everyday life into the everyday interaction yeah so therefore the theoretical foundations of the project are uh, G's notions of projective identity drawn from game-based learning as well as the large body of literature on embodied cognition as well as our own work in terms of uh, the design of uh, immersive learning environments so um, so in its complete form, the project comprises two complementary halves, as I've said, a scripted system which records avatar interaction, followed by a post discussion in either face to face or remote home based learning contexts. Some pictures would be, uh, be necessary here. So this is an example of the um, em embodied half uh, where students as avatars get to explore an environment which um, uh, is more or less a uh, uh, suggestive of a typical Singapore neighborhood together with, uh, complete with public housing estates, high rise playgrounds and so on and so forth. Um, from time to time, the students avatars around them will appear these different colored discs, uh, depending on the proximity of the uh, uh, students to each other. So for example, here, uh, the, the discs are red because um, so the, the, the differential color of the disk indicates the uh, say, uh, uh, proximity of uh, each other in terms of uh, possibility of uh, uh, diffusion of a virus. And followed by that is the dialogic half, the data from these interactions, yeah? The data from these interactions is recorded in real time and um, the teacher and the students can have access to the data uh, after the activity. So here, for example, is a overview given to the teacher during the gameplay uh, of different stages of, uh, of each stage. And uh, the teacher can have a glance at uh, on this web-based dashboard as to who is infected at, what, at which stage of the interaction. Um, this is um, at the level of the individual student. In this case, the individual student's avatar name is Simona Stick. Um, uh, the individual student is also given feedback immediately uh, after his or her interactions as to uh, who they interacted with and whether that interaction may have resulted in a uh, the spread of the virtual virus um, and so on and so forth. So in summary, because I'm going to hand over to Ahmed pretty soon, um, Sobe has two halves. The first half on the left is an embodied half. The second half is a dialogic half. The, the advantages of, uh, the affordances of both are as follows. In terms of the embodied half, uh, uh, it, um, it has advantages over traditional simulations in the sense that there is uh, a very high degree of learner agency. The, the learners themselves get to determine, uh, decide for themselves who they, uh, the extent to which they, they want to mix around, the extent to which they want to interact, the extent to which they want to isolate themselves rather than just passively observe a simulation. Um, there's visual augmentation of safe radius as I've tried to explain. 
And the uh, embodied half is customizable in a number of ways in terms of the duration of the um, activity, in terms of the probability of infection, and also in terms of uh, who patient zero is. Um, and um, uh, as for the dialogic half, uh, the, the dialogic half comprises a web-based dashboard, and therefore it's uh, uh, easily accessible and scalable. Uh, the data is uh, just tab delimited data, which can easily be exported to Google Sheets or Microsoft Cloud, and so on and so forth. Yep. So um, to to summarize, as I said, this is a this is I showed the slide earlier. It's motivation for the survey project. Uh, we've tried to address this disconnect between um, feedback uh, between uh, decision making and the consequences of, of the decision on a community. Yeah. Um, some possible applications of Sorbet in terms of learning. Uh, in its original form, we originally applied it to mathematics lessons in terms of the learning of probability theory. Uh, it could also potentially be applied to geography, to citizenship education, to the sciences as well. Um, and we are indeed exploring these uh, inactive explorations with teachers at both primary and secondary school levels in Singapore. And we, of course, welcome collaborations internationally. Um, yeah, so Sorbet could also be deployed as standalone uh, uh, kiosks in publicly accessible spaces because it is uh, based on open source uh, infrastructure. Um, this one minute video uh, is taken from a um, is taken from a popular YouTube uh, channel which focuses on travel. And I'd like I'd like, just like to take one minute of your time to just play the video because. Um, I've talked a lot about social distancing today, but um, social, as, as this gentleman is trying to explain, social distancing is more than just standing six feet away from someone else. Um, we are trying to give uh, the, the children, the students, an understanding that um, um, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's more than just, you know, just don't stand next to each other. But there are actual, if, if, if you truly get uh, if you truly get uh, through an authentic uh, through an authentic experience uh, personalized to your own interaction uh, um, of um, socially responsible behavior, uh, you would take the initiative to 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 practice a number of related steps uh, such as this gentleman will now explain within one minute. I think you need to. Are you? Are you need to yeah. share the sound? Oh, but uh, so you can't hear the sound, is it? Yeah. Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear the sound or not? Hear the sound? Cannot. Cannot hear, is it? Oh yeah. Cannot hear. Cannot hear. So, okay. Cannot yeah, hear. What you need to okay. do? Yep. Yeah. Long sound. I'm listening to you. Or uh, if if not, it's okay. We can just. What uh, yeah, or you can explain. Yeah, because uh, okay, yeah. I can talk over it. I can no problem. Okay, in in which case I'll mute my own uh uh computer audio so that I won't get distracted and I'll just talk over it. Okay, so um, so the gentleman here is saying that as you uh, as you can see from his actions, it's more than like I was saying, it's more than just wearing a mask and standing six feet away, um, because as in the subtitle here. He, he goes on to talk about um, uh, a whole suite of related uh, behaviors, uh, which, 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 which together practiced will, will embody um, a true understanding of social responsibility. Um, so he, he's talking about, for example, when you go to a hotel, because it's a travel related block, when you go to a hotel to check in, you don't need necessarily to have the whole family to go in and check in in the hotel lobby, but the family can stay outside. And likewise, um, at a supermarket, when you're doing groceries, you, you don't necessarily have to take the whole family along or the children inside, but you can actually just um, delegate who takes what um, uh, and, and therefore limit the amount of exposure that the, the, the family members get uh, um, exposed to. Yep, so that basically is that. We'll go on to the, one of the concluding slides. Uh, let's go on to the next concluding slide. Okay. Yep. 
Okay, so here in Singapore, our ministry is encouraging uh, our teachers to explore blended learning, which uh, Long Xiang will is is more than uh, uh, is more than qualified to talk about. Um, and uh, we we see uh, the Sorbet project as complementing this drive because originally uh, it was uh, the, it, it can be it can be done in both face to face context as well as. Uh, home-based learning context, as well as actually uh, potentially a hybrid model. So uh, these are some photographs of uh, Sorbet in real life, uh, so to speak, uh, in, in schools in Singapore. And um, yeah, uh, and basically that's it. Uh, we've uh, just got a bit of feedback if you'd like um, um, to, to learn about it. Uh, the children have generally um, uh, responded well. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of quantitative feedback to report because we were not able to conduct a proper study given the protocols uh, presently in place in school. Um, so a lot of it is anecdotal and qualitative, but nevertheless, uh, it gives you a general uh, taste of uh, uh, the, how the students are responding. I, I can, of course, share these slides with you later on uh, so that you can read them at your leisure. Okay, so um, I think that is it. Yeah. So, um, uh, Long Xiang, I'm done. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank the audience and uh, just a reminder that I'll be handing over to my colleague, Ahmed, who will be able to give you a demonstration. Long Xiang? Yes, uh, so Ahmed, yeah, uh, you take over. Sure. Hello, everyone. So, I'm going to share my screen with everyone so that you can actually see uh, my demonstration. So, yeah, I'm just going to share my whole desktop because I am actually, and uh, let me know if you have any problems seeing what I'm showing you on the screen. So we have here two different things. Um, you can ignore the web page on the left. On the right side of the screen, I'm showing you the um, immersive environment that we actually uh, run the sorbet activity in. So as Kenneth mentioned before, this environment is meant to look uh, somewhat similar to a typical Singapore uh, HDB neighborhood, which is why we have like a housing block tower in front of us. We have some shop houses in the background. You got a playground. And as I move around, you'll see a couple of other buildings as well. You can see right now in the environment, there's a few different uh, avatars hanging around. Um, for today's demonstration, I've populated the environment with these characters, but in a real lesson, every character that you see, every avatar would represent an actual student. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, we are using an open source platform called OpenSim for this. Uh, we've, we've been using it for quite a few years for different lessons, but uh, this year, due to the pandemic, uh, that's how we came across this particular application of using this platform. And um, this platform is server-based. I'm actually connected to a cloud server right now, as are all the avatars that you can see in the environment. And you can connect to it from PC and Mac. Um, basically, you need, a, you need a computer for this. We're looking into the possibility of opening up Sorbet to mobile platforms, but uh, not at the moment. So. Um, the way that this would work in a classroom and a, as, as a class lesson is that all of the students in the class would log into the environment first um, on their respective computers. And once all of the students are in the environment, the teacher can then do, uh, can actually set up the simulation, which is going to run in the background while the students are doing things. So. When I click this uh, big red button on the right hand side, which says reset simulation, I would be taken to this web page, which you see on the left side of my screen. Now this web page actually lets me set up a virus simulation within the Sorbet environment. First thing I can do is I can select one person to be the initial infected person. In this case, I think I'm going to select myself because I'm going to be walking around in the environment and I can have a chance of spreading it to other people. But yeah, you can see here, there's a list of different avatars inside. So the teacher can actually just let the system choose, randomize, or they can select whoever they want. The next thing I can choose 
is actually the probability of in infection spread when two avatars meet each other, uh, when they get into close proximity. And the uh, range of the uh, percentage chance, uh, the lowest is here, about slightly under 3%. And the highest number, as I keep increasing, is actually about 16.6%. So I'm going to set it to the highest um, probability. The last thing is a cycle time. Now, as you'll see in a little bit, this activity takes place over multiple cycles, five cycles, where we actually, um, actually map out the spread of a virus over time. I'm going to set the timing to 60 seconds so that we can quickly go through five cycles and I can show you what happens at the end. So I've just started the, okay, let me see, oh, no, um, let me redo that because that should have started it. But, okay, I'm going to click start and, ah, great. So now the simulation has started. If we move back, I hope we don't have a problem if I resize my window. If we move back, now we can see something interesting. For every avatar that's inside here, we have a little green disk around our waists. And this green disk actually shows us whether we are uh, in close proximity to another person or not, whether we are within two meters of someone, roughly two meters. -ish. So if I go close to this lady over here, we can see that the next time the ring flashes, it's turned red because I'm um, too close. We are basically yeah, within, uh, not within safe distance of each other anymore. You can see these two are not within safe distance. If I go over to this group that's near the HDB flat, oh, I actually thought they might have been too close, but it seems like they were actually a nice distance away from each other. But if I go stand in the middle, you can see that um, we are now actually a little bit too close to each other. And yeah, while I was describing things, the first cycle has ended. And just before I go to show you uh, what the teacher would see on the web page, basically the students are free to do whatever they want in this environment. They can move around freely. And depending on the specific lesson, uh, some teachers opt to have different kinds of activities to, for the students to do. So let me go back to the web page so you can actually see what has happened in cycle one. So if we look down here, we can see a list of the avatars. We can see that so far, I'm the only person that's been infected. Um, sorry for all the scrolling. Okay. But yeah, this interface at the top lets me see cycle by cycle, what has been happening. If I go back to cycle one, we can see I was the only person infected. And if we go to cycle two, we can see, ah, now there have been four people. So by switching between the two, uh, between the two tabs, I can see the progress of the infection so far. Oh, and we just started cycle three. So if I click on cycle three, yeah, and we see who has been infected. Another thing that we can do is we can actually click on one of the names, for example, my name, and then we can see a list of the different interactions. These are all the times I've been close to another avatar. And the red colored entries denote when uh, there would have been a uh, virus transmission during that interaction between us. So, We've run this in a few schools over the past um, two months from July, uh, August, September, October. Yeah, two months or so. And we've primarily been doing it in uh, mathematics classrooms, but we are also exploring doing it in other classrooms. For maths lessons, uh, teachers have been incorporating it into um, into statistics and probability, actually. They're interested in getting students to get a more embodied understanding of the probability curve of a virus as it spreads through a population. So right now in this simulation, you can see there's only 15 avatars, but in the maths lessons, you get 40 plus students at the same time, all wandering around, 
uh, engaging in activities like scavenger hunts where they're trying to collect different objects which are hidden within, within the environment. And as they take on these activities, they're actually not told at the start of the lesson that there is a uh, virus simulation happening within. They can see the uh, circles, which are flashing red or green to indicate social distance, but the students themselves do not see this uh, simulation summary web page, which I'm showing you right now. Uh, so as they go across, they, um, yeah, they don't really know what's happening on the back end, and they're free to do whatever they like for usually fifteen usually anywhere between 15 minutes to 40 minutes. It can, the lesson can, um, the activity inside the online environment can be as long as it needs to be, depending on uh, how the teacher wants to structure it. Uh, I just set it to five minutes total for, for this demonstration. And so you can see, yeah, I've spread it to a couple of people. We are on the last 30 seconds of cycle five. So maybe I'll go inside and see if I can actually manage to infect the last two people. So I'll just move over here. So these people who are being very good and distancing themselves are now at risk because, yeah, I'm in close proximity to both of them. So uh, this becomes quite interesting during lessons because students can actually kind of make links between their behavior and the infection. Okay, so now the activity has ended. Something which happens when the activity ends is that uh, not only would the teacher see this little pop-up on the right-hand side here, but all the students also get a pop-up giving them a link to go to the uh, simulation summary. Basically the same interface that you saw just now, but the students get the view now at the end as well. And they can also see this additional page the final report, which gives a cycle-by-cycle -cycle overview of what happened. So cycle zero, we see uh, who patient zero was. We see that during cycle one, I didn't infect any new people. Cycle two, I infected three people. Cycle four, one new person got infected. And cycle five, three more people got infected. And if we go to this page and go through the um, for example, if we want to know who infected the last person in cycle five and the last person, oh, last three people, that's two, three, and one, I could actually click on one of their names and I can see in cycle one, they had a red flagged interaction with Mr. A06, but because A06 and 01 are not initially infected, that doesn't result in a transmission of virus. And we keep going down. You see there's a whole lot of interactions with different people. Ah, we get back to A06, but this time round, it actually transmitted uh, the infection because one or more of them, one either one of them had been infected by the end there. So um, for these lessons, what the teachers and students actually do is the students actually take snapshots with their phones of their individual interaction histories so that they can reconstruct with each other the progress of the virus as it spread from cycle to cycle. So that's, let me see, that's about the whole activity. Um, let's see, I think I've described everything. Oh, one more thing which the teacher can do, which I think I should highlight. Um, the teacher has the ability to, at the end of the session, if they would like to see what would have happened if the inf infection probability was lower, they can go back to the settings and they can change the infection probability from say seven to, I'm gonna set it lower, to two, which is the lowest probability. If I click apply, I would then see what the result would have been. Okay, so if we had a lower chance, a lower probability of spreading the infection whenever two people meet, then the simulation would have ended with only one person remaining infected because the chance of infection spreading whenever anyone meets another person is only 2.78%.
So in this case, if we look at uh, my interactions, even though I had 47 interactions with different people, as you can see, none of them were read. So this actually also can serve as a learning point for the students. They can also change the identity of patient zero if they wanted to see like what would have happened if uh, A11 was the initial infected person instead. And we can set the probability back to the highest one. So now I'm going to see what the results would have been if 11 was infected instead of me. Oh, okay. And as it turns out, if 11 was patient zero, the simulation would end with only one person infected. And that's because, yeah, they didn't actually interact with anyone except me once. So that's the activity as it is currently. Um, we have the immersive environment, which the students can go into and can wander around and do different things. And then you have the teacher's viewpoint where they can set up the simulation. Uh, they can decide who is infected and all these things. And once the infection ends, the students get the reveal and they can actually download their data, which can then be used for subsequent lessons. So I think um, I might stop my share for the time being and uh, potentially we could go into questions unless Kenneth, is there anything you want to say? Or... Uh, no, I'm uh, fine. Kenneth, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, yeah. Ahmed. Yeah. Can I have anything to add? No? Fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for both of you for uh, making this presentation. Uh, we can move on to Q&A session. We still have about 15 minutes. Uh, uh, would any participants have any questions to ask? Maybe you need to type it in Q&A. Yeah. Or chat. Either way. Right. Any of you have any question? But actually, also uh, try to give everybody some background information. Uh, of course, uh, we, we actually we have some we received some feedback on why we set the uh, the timing at this uh, actually at eight pm or nine pm around uh, at this uh, this part of the world. Uh, well, because uh, actually when we took this, uh, we actually look at. Uh, we try to be more inclusive there because we do have some of uh, American and European participants here, yeah, which is their morning or afternoon time. Uh, but of course, in the future, our future webinars uh, will still keep this open. Uh, we, we are not going to stick to, always stick to uh, this kind of timing that we look at uh, different topics and maybe different uh, audience uh, we, are, we are trying to. But uh, for this one, we happen to just try to try out uh, this evening session. Uh, but. Uh, well, very much thank you for, for joining us uh, no matter what time zone you are in right now uh, uh, okay uh, there's one question uh, from Wei Qin uh, do you experience that the students ask what the circles mean is in chat <clears throat> um, um, um. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think circles, we can both. Yeah. We can both. Yeah, maybe we can. Yeah. 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 Both. Both, both of us. Are mute, so we can have a like a dialogue. Yep. Um, yeah. What What would be your response on it? Because. Uh, um, I think what I what I have observed is that the students certainly notice the discs, and I think, okay, I I think some of them kind of assume. I don't know if they were preconditioned by the teachers or not, but I think they some. Some of them actually assume that, oh, it is something to do with social distance. Um, while others kind of ignore it because they're busy doing their own activities inside there. So it comes on and maybe they comment, oh, suddenly there's discs. But they don't, they don't tend to ask. They just do what they're doing because they consider it a game. Yeah. They've got uh, their own I, tasks. I, I would kind of concur because uh, at least currently, so far we've been, um, the, the, the age cohort, that we've been um, uh, um, working with teachers with the students on uh, would be 13 and 14 year olds. And um, basically, I think the students have been game to try anything. And they're at that age when everything is um, 
I mean, they they take everything at face value. Uh, they 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 are not. Um, they haven't gone to the stage where they are like cynical adolescents yet. So, um, um, I think my observations are that they don't necessarily. It doesn't necessarily intrude into their consciousness, which is kind of what we are trying to get at. Because we're just trying to do a subliminal uh, reinforcement um, of. Of, of of good of social of socially responsible behavior. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so we are going to be checking out uh just now I think we're checking out uh, our live on Facebook anyway. Yeah, we're actually doing that as well. Uh well so uh there have been uh, the rest of you do you have any other question? While waiting for the next maybe I can ask you because uh she can have an, an, an and use make a couple of presentations internally before. Uh, so uh, we do realize that actually uh, you are you are not just uh, developing develop this uh, this simulation and then just show it to the students to try it out and whether or not the teachers around. So actually, teachers are actually playing a role in in all this uh, this uh, implementation of the uh, or running of this. Uh, so so uh, would you try to talk about? how the teachers are, are involved when uh, the students are using this. Yeah, thanks, Nong Siang. So uh, that, that's, of course, uh, that, that, that's of course very uh, true and uh, fundamental to both your own uh, philosophy when you, when you interact with your, your own group of uh, teachers as well as my own team's philosophy. I think, I think any good, uh, it, it, any good learning scientist would, would adopt that. Um, um, and what we, so essentially, uh, the, the way we try to um, build teacher capacity is to help them, um, to help them, because t teachers, um, um, we, just, just like subject disciplines, um, teachers can sometimes uh, be too close to the content to 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 see the to see the forest uh, to see the to see the forest instead of the trees. So sometimes us as teachers, and I count myself included, sometimes we, we see things too much in a silo of the of of, of our own respective subjects. So I um, I think it's important for 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 us as teachers to to um, to bear in mind the, the, the bigger picture of uh, of of Sobe, which is regardless of whether you're approaching this through the lens of geography or through the lens of science or through the lens of mathematics uh, the bigger picture is in terms of what in Singapore is known as uh, character and citizenship education CCE but of course it, it differs from uh, country to country, but uh, more or less the same thing, social values, positive social values. Um, and um, the teachers during the, um, during the two halves, um, they're still learning to, 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 to think beyond their own um, native domain, uh, but definitely, uh, we th those who are able to 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 bring the conversation of the lesson beyond the the immediate subject silo uh, are, are those which are seeing richer uh, dialogic interactions. Um, we have actually tried this with a, a couple of students uh, because we have uh, interns uh, attached to us for the year, um, and uh, so for example, just today this afternoon. We tried it in a secondary school where two of our secondary school interns, uh, who are obviously not trained as teachers, tried it uh, with their own uh, among their own peers, and um, um, the lesson, uh, well, not lesson, the activity went. So this was a totally unsupervised, uh, un, uh, teacher non-supervised activity, just uh, peers uh, inter uh, trying the activity with their own peers. And um, the feedback that they gave us was uh, that um, they realized that uh, 
the learning points did not come across so well as they had hoped among their own peers because they lacked the experience of um, constructing what uh, what would what what would regularly be known as a zone of proximal development, a ZPD, a ZPD, uh, because us as teachers, we of course, um, uh, this, constructing a, Z, a ZPD comes to us very natively, but when you're a 13 or 14 year old student uh, who's who himself or herself is struggling with uh, content, uh, there's that the, the expertise of constructing a Z, ZPD for your own peers is is, is not there yet. So uh, what you, your observation is very accurate and uh, very true. Yeah, thanks, Mosia. Thank you. Am I got anything to add or oh, that's all? <laughs> oh, I think, I think, yeah, that about sums it up. <laughs> yeah. uh, now I wonder whether audience have any, attendees have any other question. Uh, we have, I uh, still have six minutes to have at least one question about any other question. If not, maybe, maybe I can ask one last question. Yeah, uh, I've been I've been imagining that uh, we cause of our actually the simulations were well, uh, you you uh, your team developed the simulations, so it means that you are able to tweak it and doing something maybe even average it. Yeah, so recently actually when you make presentation locally actually uh, there was a science teacher actually asked me how can this be applied to science learning, so I've been started imagining because just now when I saw your 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 video I've been talking about because uh, your most of most of the part of uh, your video actually are showing that uh, uh, the simulation outdoor in outdoor but there's also one simulation is indoor yeah so as you know that I mean uh, once you under when you understand COVID better actually we uh, we know that uh, in, at the indoor environment is actually easier to spread the virus than outdoor uh, I don't know how they're going to explain that maybe let's say for example it might be relevant to food dynamics or whatever so let's say if we want to work with science teachers that uh, you actually add this kind of, this kind of simulation like to dynamic survival in this. Yeah, so, so do you think that, I mean, technically is it possible? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll save some time for Ahmed to respond. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's a great question because uh, uh, it based, uh, the, a related question would, uh, which we've also received uh, from our own interns, our own student interns, because uh, we, we get very high quality interns, is um, might there be a way of differentiating uh, infection probabilities based on whether the avatars themselves are wearing masks or not? Um, so yeah, these are, these are questions which uh, Ahmed and I have been thinking about. We've applied for a grant uh, and we are still pending the outcome of the grant. And um, one, if, if and when we do get a positive outcome for the grant, we intend to do a ground up rewrite of Sorbet, uh, which will be compatible with uh, tablets and smartphones. And uh, once we have that kind of uh, autonomy and freedom, we, uh, we, we will definitely be bearing these in mind. I'm now going to hand over to Ahmed uh, for the final mm -hmm. word. Uh, okay, so yes, basically the current version of Sorbet um, has a few limitations in terms of um, it's it's pretty close to uh, if th this platform we're using OpenSim made it very easy for us to build this in the space of like just under two months but uh, the possibilities for expanding beyond the current scope are a bit limited that's why with the up upcoming uh, grant which we've applied for which Kenneth mentioned we are planning to port this over to a different engine so that we can actually start incorporating some of these uh, ideas and concepts to make it a little bit richer. Um, basically, yeah, we know, we know what this version can do and uh, we'll be pushing it a little bit further with the next version, but um, probably, probably we'll just be taking uh, things into account for the time being. I, I would say for the for the next, the remainder of this year, um, probably the version that you saw is the version that we're going to be using. Um, but yeah, that's this is not the version that you'll see in a year from now, if all goes well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do you, uh, the rest of you have any last one last question? 
we probably thought of. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, well thank you. Uh, let's thanks again uh, to Kenneth and Emmett yeah, for your help. And also, I would like to thank uh, some of my colleagues here for your support uh, with uh, Alex as well as Maika and a few others like Wei Qin. And also, I also would like to thank all the attendees for participating in this, uh, this uh, session. Uh, we're going to have uh, more webinars in the future, but uh, so we're still programming that. So we'll gradually release uh, all these uh, new webinars information on this and hope uh, you can continue to support us. Okay, thank you. Good night. Bye. Or actually, good morning or good afternoon for the rest of the world. Bye.